Hey everyone, I'm John with Roadkill Incorporated. Today I want to talk about something that's been bugging me for the entire 15 years I've been an Apple refurbisher. So you've certainly heard about Right to Repair. It's had quite a bit of success lately, notably in Minnesota and California, and that's really great. But I do have a lot of concerns, not problems with right to repair specifically, but concerns that we're not seeing the big picture and that millions of perfectly good devices are slipping by us. The problem is we have a lot of blind spots. There's a whole spectrum of other repair issues, industry issues that are much more difficult to see. And if we don't take care of those as well, then we're really not completing our mission of a sustainable future. I call these other issues right to reuse. I call it that because rather than having to do with individuals repairing their own stuff, it has to do with all the tens of millions of machines that corporations, schools, government, and individuals discard. Once a device is done with its first owner, right to reuse deals with putting that device back into the world. It fights for the viability of reuse, basically. And because most devices have or should have a second life, that's pretty much every device out there in the world that we're talking about. But first, let's go over briefly the half of the solution most people know something about, right to repair. What is right to repair exactly? Well, it's several things. It makes a lot of demands of manufacturers. It requires them to provide you with any proprietary tools you may need to fix their devices. If they make a weird non-standard screwdriver, for example, they have to sell that to you. It requires them to produce documentation, basically anything they would also provide to an authorized repair facility. Repair shops should not have to waste time googling around in the dark when the repair is well known by the manufacturer. And it requires them to provide you OEM parts at prices that are fair and reasonable. All this is great stuff and it's a good first step, but it's useful to ask, who does right to repair benefit? Well, right to repair is consumer facing, which I really want to stress. It ultimately benefits everyone, uh, the benefit sort of trickles outward, but the main target is the consumer market. A consumer who wants to fix an iPhone screen can fix it more easily and use OEM parts. The owner of a three-year-old MacBook should be able to replace a bad screen or board for a few hundred dollars instead of a thousand dollars as happens today. Possibly most significantly, right to repair benefits consumer-facing repair shops, giving them access to OEM parts so they don't have to either turn down the repair or reach out to China for third-party parts which are most likely inferior quality. An independent repair shop should have the resources at hand to do repairs as well as an authorized entity, and with right to repair they no longer have to wear the scarlet letter and be called second-rate or inferior simply because they don't have access and must effectively resort to the black market. And all this is great. But there's still a ways to go. It's only been passed in a couple states so far, but what we're hoping for here is something called the Brussels effect. The idea being that if one state or region of a larger entity passes a law that requires manufacturers to comply, then instead of having one set of policies for the single state and a different one for everyone else, the manufacturer gives in and applies the new rules to everyone. From the manufacturer's standpoint, that can actually make sense in terms of streamlining operations. Plus, obviously, if you can get parts and documentation in Minnesota, they're going to be trickling out of Minnesota anyway, so it's pointless to hold back. So hopefully the Brussels effect will take hold and right to repair will effectively be nationwide soon. We will still have to make sure manufacturers comply and there will still be arguments and lawsuits over many use cases about what right to repair covers and doesn't. But it's all good and this is where we want to be. After years of uphill battles, it's amazing to finally see the light. So what is this video for then? We've got all this great stuff coming, so why am I still finding a reason to complain? Well, I don't want right to reuse to be forgotten, to put it simply. As I said, right to repair is mostly consumer facing. Therefore, it's the most visible and easier half of the problem to solve. You can basically ask anyone, hey, don't you think you should be able to fix that broken screen on your phone? And just like that, you've created an advocate because you've made an association with a very tangible use case that is relatable to people. Well, with right to reuse, the hidden half of the problem, signified by the darker half of the circle, it's not that easy. Right to reuse is behind the scenes. It concerns millions of devices dumped by schools, governments, corporations, and consumer channels to recyclers. It has to do with institutions making irresponsible choices behind closed doors, and a recycling industry that is often more interested in making money and avoiding liability than doing the right thing and favoring reuse. It concerns short-sighted recycling certifications and market conditions that make it easier to destroy devices than bother reusing them. And all of this, unfortunately, is not stuff the average person has ever witnessed. I often make the analogy to slaughterhouses. We all know there are places where thousands of animals are killed, and if we think about that, we might find it disturbing. 
but because we've never visited a slaughterhouse and put on the boots and the apron and the gloves and walked through puddles of blood and witnessed the noises and the smells, it's easy to simply forget because our minds have not been impressed with this reality. And similarly, our daily routine does not remind us of the thousands of destroyed devices the same way that your finger reminds you it got cut on the broken screen of your phone. So what are these issues specifically? These aren't all of them, but here's a list. I'll give a summary of each one. Software locks, most notably activation lock. Software locks are a really, really big one. Apple's activation lock is by far the most well known. It's sold as a security feature, and we're conditioned to believe that any activation locked device found in the wild was probably stolen. The fact is, however, that institutions dump millions of devices to recyclers and fail to log them out properly, so they remain locked and Apple provides no resource to resolve this. Even new computers that cost $5,000 are turned into bricks. Millions of locked devices get scrapped, or if they do make it outside the system, they are most likely useless or assumed stolen. It's not a data security issue. Most of the devices are wiped, but still locked. You can watch my other videos on this topic for more details, and there are certainly many equivalents of activation lock from other manufacturers. Remote management locks. And I put lock in quotes because remote management is not intended to be a lock. It's often called DEP, Device Enrollment Program, or MDM, Mobile Device Management. Similar to activation lock, an institution will often leave its devices enrolled in their remote management system when they discard them, assuming they're going to be destroyed or just not thinking about it. But because enrollment status is determined by serial number, even if that machine is wiped, it will come up managed as soon as it touches the internet. It presents a login prompt and effectively bricks the machine because the new user can't log in. Institutions most typically do not respond when asked by recyclers to remove devices from their systems. This effectively kills millions of laptops and phones. Parts pairing. Increasingly, companies like Apple are cryptographically pairing many parts of a device to each other and to the board. If you swap a good part from one device to replace the broken part of another, it either won't work or the swap results in decreased functionality. You would think activation-locked MacBooks would at least be good for their screens, right? Wrong, because swapping screens on newer MacBooks results in the loss of the True Tone feature and possibly other features. Refurbishers that depend on using parts from hundreds of broken machines to fix others, at best, will end up with semi-defective devices they can't sell as 100% working. And these parts effectively can't be sold because consumers install them and find that they're missing features. Antitrust issues mostly concerns lack of access to marketplaces. So what's the point of reuse and refurbishing if refurbishers don't have access to the marketplace where devices are sold? Amazon controls literally 50% of the online marketplace for all things. Like it or not, it's where we buy stuff. If they kick you off their marketplace, as they did to me and all the small Apple sellers in 2018, then half of the world of online selling is off limits. What will motivate resellers and refurbishers to bother selling refurbished computers and devices if they don't have access to the places that goods are sold? It's a big topic, but in short, the number of legitimate options for reselling devices is shrinking, and legitimate small businesses are being banished to the back alleys. This does no good for consumers, and it's devastating to the effort to get used devices back into the world. Third-party parts availability, such as batteries and chargers. The thing is, reuse, and especially refurbishing on a large scale, often cannot happen at all without third-party parts. This is something people don't realize. Even if OEM parts are available and priced, quote-unquote, fairly and reasonably, the price is usually so high that it doesn't make sense for a five-year-old laptop. Laptops that sell on the street for $75 simply are not viable if a replacement charger or battery costs $99. Legitimate third-party replacements are usually branded counterfeit or fake by the OEMs, and even stopped and confiscated at the border. To make matters worse, many third-party parts actually are subpar quality and rightly deserve to be criticized, which really doesn't help the situation. For the sake of refurbishing and extending the life of products, not to mention consumer choice and competitive pricing, we need to encourage legitimate third-party manufacturers. But the third-party landscape is degrading rather than improving. Destruction by recyclers and greenwashing. So electronics recyclers are like a Tetris game in a warehouse. Big chunks of stuff come in and they need to get it out before more arrives. They don't have time to spend on individual items. 
and they have to get it out in compliance with outdated certifications, which insist on overly strict data destruction techniques and pointless administrative overhead. Preparing for reuse takes far more effort and requires specialized processes that they just don't have time for, and these things increase the cost of reuse such that perfectly viable older devices are now quote-unquote over the line and considered not worth it. The easier and cheaper option is to scrap material and recover the scrap value. Recyclers destroy tens of millions of perfectly good devices every year that were one way or the other, and for many reasons, determined to not be worth the time to process for reuse. Market forces, rather than viability of a product, determine whether it gets scrapped or not. Recyclers all know these dirty secrets, but it's an incredibly insular industry, and they just don't admit to what goes on in their warehouses, fearing liability issues and wanting to retain their precious certifications which allow them to keep their biggest customers. Additionally, the recycling industry markets its activity as 100% recycled, which sounds great, but it amounts to greenwashing because consumers don't realize recycling means destroyed. It doesn't mean reused. Recycling, in fact, is a failure to reuse. Planned obsolescence, such as integrated storage. Ten years ago, recyclers evaded overly time-consuming data destruction requirements by simply pulling the hard drives out of laptops and then selling them to refurbishers without hard drives. But as of 2016, the SSDs in MacBooks are part of the logic board. So now what do they do? They pull and destroy the board. I've been offered thousands of almost new M1 Macs that just need a board. Integrated storage and a hundred different planned obsolescence techniques, whether they are intended maliciously by manufacturers or not, are adding a labor cost to refurbishing, and when it comes down to it, it just pushes stuff in the direction of being destroyed. Destruction agreements. This is a really scary one. Increasingly, institutions and a lot of government are contracting recyclers to simply destroy all their devices after the three, four, five year life cycle, to simply grind it into dust. I'm not kidding. They like to be able to market that they have a zero tolerance security policy. They prefer to just destroy it all than take the tiniest liability risk. In this case, recyclers don't even have the option of reuse. I'm aware of thousands and thousands of modern MacBooks that have been destroyed this way and thousands of phones and tablets. It's a disturbing trend and it's only increasing. 15 years ago, I never saw this, but now it happens all the time. And in this situation, sadly, right to repair barely matters. Repairability barely matters. If the choice has been made to literally destroy the material, it leaves me speechless, really. I don't even know what to say. If you value reuse so little that you're willing to shoot the hostage, so to speak, then I don't know, I don't even know what to do. Property rights, the first sale doctrine. We can't forget that we actually, by law, do have rights. In a nutshell, the first sale doctrine is the law that says we have property rights. It says we have the right to sell, destroy, modify, basically do what we want with the things that we own. And all the right to reuse issues we've talked about so far are designed to chip away at your property rights. From terms of service agreements requiring you to treat the things you own like subscriptions, to the second owner not gaining all the services the first had, to a complete lack of ability to overcome locks if you buy a locked device that wasn't stolen. So that's a good rundown. I could talk for hours on each topic, and I do on my channel if you're interested. So hopefully you can see why right to reuse is important. Right to repair primarily concerns the first user of a device, but once it's discarded, once it's sold or passed on, it enters the right to reuse realm. And as you can see, a thousand different forces are trying hard to make the second and third and fourth use completely impossible. And again, you really have to ask, if basically every device out there is not allowed to live past its initial owner, have we really done much for sustainability? Have we really met our goal here? Okay, so the big question, I'm doing all this whining, but what about action? What do we do about this? I wish I had a great answer, I, I really do. A lot of it, I think, has to do with awareness, though. Turning on the light in that dark world of right to reuse, making the destruction visible, making it tangible, that's what I've been trying to do for 15 years. Show people pictures of the destruction so their brains are imprinted with that image. There hasn't been a ton of progress, but there's been some. I train people to replicate my own refurbishing business, buying from recyclers and putting devices back into the world, and that's been amazing, but the forces working against us are gaining too much ground, and I fear that soon traditional refurbishing and therefore reuse will just not be possible. Thousands of small businesses and refurbishers that provide millions of computers to consumers will simply not be able to cut it anymore. 
Individual action is always necessary and beneficial, but when individuals can no longer make progress, group action is necessary. The FTC is the agency that is supposed to step in to protect consumers in these situations, but they've largely been out to lunch on all this, and quite honestly, they seem much more about marketing than taking action. So what it comes down to is that legislation will be necessary. It's necessary because Apple is not going to be convinced to reform activation lock on their own. Recyclers aren't simply going to lose money in order to process every single viable device for reuse. Manufacturers are not going to stop integrating components and locking them down. Irresponsible institutions are not going to stop having their devices shredded just because we ask nicely. What it comes down to is our property rights are not going to be reaffirmed unless we fight for them, so a massive legislation effort is necessary. I have to say, it's been a really long journey. Starting my business 15 years ago was the best decision I ever made, and I'm proud that I've put 100,000 used devices back into the world. I fear a world in which that is no longer possible, though, a world in which the best thing I ever did, and the best thing so many others have done, is no longer possible, and all that possibility just gets ground up into dust in the dark where no one even sees. I've been pushing right to reuse for 15 years, and for a lot of those years, I've sort of been biting my tongue with the knowledge that it's appropriate for right to repair, to go to battle first, to be the first wave of attack. But since that attack is now nearing success, we need to realize that right to repair is only half of the solution. In order to save devices past their first owner, in order to save basically all used devices and computers in the world from premature destruction, we need to strike hard with the second wave of attack, and that is right to reuse. So get ready everyone, because it's coming. Thanks for listening.